Tea, Coffee, Murder, Episode 3, Blue Poodle Blues, written by Ellen Barksdale, narrated by Jessica Whittaker. Prologue, in which the preparations for an attack are made. Come in. The young woman opened the door to her small laboratory in the basement. I was expecting you earlier. Her visitor walked past a row of glass cabinets in which brown glass bottles stood packed together on several tiers. Each one had been meticulously labelled with its contents and supplementary notes. Some also had small orange or red labels warning of a lethal or corrosive effect. Hmm, said the man. Chemistry has always been a closed book for me. At school, all those symbols for different elements were a mystery to me. What a shame. It's such an interesting subject. And so many uses in life, the young woman said, and reached for a spray bottle. Really? Like this, for example. This is your little magic formula to panic the ladies, as requested. He smiled. Let the young woman believe that it's a harmless prank. If she had known, whether she would have given him the spray was by no means certain. How does it work? The woman pulled the corners of her mouth down slightly. The layman's version will do, he continued a little impatiently. He wanted to know what he had to watch out for. Okay, so... On the one hand, there's the dye that colours the hair, but it's also surrounded by an inhibitor that stops the dye from doing its actual job. As she talked, she looked at the bottle in her hand proudly. To this is added a solvent, which doesn't do its work until it's exposed to oxygen for about 10 to 15 minutes. The solvent splits the inhibitor, so to speak, and then the dye comes into play. That's putting it as simply as I can. The older man nodded with satisfaction. That was exactly what he wanted. Very good. Even I can understand that. Thank you very much. He reached out his hand for the bottle. First the money, she said. Here's your fifty pounds, he replied after taking the wallet out of his jacket. One hundred? What? We had agreed on one hundred, she stressed. Really? For the work I've had with it, I could charge far more, she said. Do you want it or not? It's all right. You're right, he replied. I thought, well, never mind. Here, have the hundred. Thank you. The young woman studied the man's expression, finally handing him the spray bottle. Remember, no air must get to the contents, or the mixture will turn into spray paint within minutes. Yes, of course. Thank you for your efforts, he replied and turned to leave. She followed him to the door, which she had locked after he had come in, and unlocked it again. I'd love to help again, she said. Maybe next time you'll have something really complicated for me. He nodded to her and went to his car. When he got in, he realised she now knew the make and registration number of his car. He cursed himself for not thinking of parking somewhere else. The woman would probably never know what her little masterpiece was really for anyway. The incident would be too insignificant, or at worst, not seem relevant. So far, everything was going according to plan. Now he just had to wait for the right moment. Then he'd show them. Chapter 1. When Natalie Needs Advice But Doesn't Get It Next time, I'll pick up the tab said Rob Hale, as Natalie walked him to his van, which was parked in front of the Black Feather. But not in my own pub, she returned, amused. What would that look like? 
Pity. I tip well, Rob said laughing. Oh, you should have said that earlier. He rubbed his three-day beard. Is there anywhere else around here where we can eat? There's the comfy chair in Earl's Raven Market Square. Natalie ran her hand through her hair, which seemed far too long, even after only four weeks since her visit to the hairdresser in Liverpool. It's got a new owner, wouldn't mind checking it out. In a village like this, it's not easy to try to offer something new. It's no different over in Penford, said Rob. Being vegetarian in this area isn't easy. Six months ago, a vegan stall appeared at the market. Let me guess. After four weeks, the stall was gone because you were pretty much the only customer. Six weeks, he said. I order from them directly now. They deliver once a week. But I feel bad for them that no one local was more interested. He unlocked the driver's door. All right, then. Scan the photos and send them over to me, and when I've had a good look at everything, we'll pick a date for me to take a look at that wall. He shook her hand for what Natalie felt was a little longer than necessary. Not that she minded, she liked him, with his stubbly beard and pitch black hair that was a little too long. He was damn good looking. She caught herself. Rob was supposed to be doing a job for her. All that mattered was that he did it properly. Whether he was handsome was completely unimportant, although, stop it. She waved to Rob, who was now driving away. Write out a hundred lines. Natalie Ames, Glenn is my boyfriend. For how long, though? A voice in the back of her head noted. Have you been spying on me? Said Natalie when she saw her cook Louise leaning against the door frame and grinning at her. I suppose old habits die hard. Cute guy, Louise said when Natalie finally arrived at the front door. A secret date? Did you deliberately pick a time when you knew I'd be visiting Mrs. Ealing in hospital? No. Odd that you didn't mention it, though, eh? He's an interesting man, and not bad-looking, I suppose. But it wasn't a date, it was work. That was Rob Hale, a restorer from Penford, she said. Ha! When did you arrange to meet him? Last week, long before poor Mrs. Ealing fell. So, where did you meet him? Natalie passed her and went inside the pub, where now, at just after 2pm, only a few guests were present. Where else do you meet men these days? On the internet. Louise followed her into the corridor between the pub on one side and the cafe on the other. It ran through the whole house, connected all the rooms and led further back to the office and the flat, where Natalie's aunt Henrietta had lived until her death a few months ago. She unlocked the door to her office. I came across a shoebox full of old photos, and some of them showed the pub around 1880 from the inside. Natalie reached for a thin stack of old photos and held them out to Louise. Take a look at the walls. Louise held the photos under the desk lamp to see them better. Are those murals? she asked. The pictures are a bit dark, Natalie replied, taking a seat at the desk but I scanned two of them and played with the brightness and contrast. Looks like they were landscapes, and in at least one case, battle scenes. You can see there's a painting on every surface, between the supporting beams. Unfortunately, in the photos, you can't tell what they are. I decided to get a professional to check if the paintings are still there. It's possible they're hidden under layers of plaster or paint. We might find something precious. Could be a great story for the local papers. And Hale is an expert on this. Well, put it this way. He was the only restorer who replied. Natalie replied. He's going to take a closer look at the photos and then carefully check in a hidden spot to find out whether this painting still exists. Maybe none of the pictures are left. And if he finds what you're looking for, Louise took a seat on the stool in front of the desk then it all depends on how much effort and cost is involved in... He's interested in you, Louise said abruptly, without responding to Natalie's last statement. Natalie looked at her cook, puzzled. What? Hale is interested in you, she said. No, he's interested in the job, that's all. Louise shook her head. He's more interested in you than in the job. Didn't you notice the way he looked at you? The way he held...